Toast the Ghost is a poser, a liar, a punk, and Demons Row TV is a fraud. And I'm going to prove it on real Outlaw Motorcycle Club history with the Patriot Gangster. What's going on, everybody? My name is Jeff Twitch Burns, and during my 22 years in the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture, I was known as Twitch 1%er or Tacoma Twitch. I rose to become a nationally known and respected 1%er and a leader in the motorcycle profiling movement. Now, I'm not a YouTube content creator, but I did spend almost my entire adult life protecting and defending the American Motorcycle Club culture. And recently, I've noticed an alarming trend of YouTube content related to Outlaw Motorcycle Clubs that's being produced by men who fraudulently represent themselves to be one percenters and experts on the culture when the reality is they're neither. They've had almost no experience in the culture and they're exploiting the American Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture and providing dishonest information to put money in their own pockets. And they're, they're exploiting the culture of silence that's part of the American Motorcycle Club culture to be able to do this. So since I'm not part of the culture anymore, I left in 2017, have no intentions of going back, there's nobody holding my tongue. And there's also very few people that have the experience that I did in the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture, so, um, or in the American Motorcycle Club culture in general. So I wanted to use my experiences to help educate the public and bring a level of understanding out there on what's real and what's not in Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture and some of the protocols so that the public can identify the frauds like Fingers Yauk and Sos the Ghost from relevant and accurate content like Insane Throttle, Danny D'Lo, and Black Dragon. Um, and to do that, I wanted to take a look at probably the most prolific poser there is when it comes to YouTube content related to motorcycle clubs. And that's Sos the Ghost and his, his show Demons Row TV, um, which professes to be the holy grail of MC culture. And the reality is the guy knows nothing more than what he can read and watch on the internet. So um, specifically, I wanna look at an episode of Demons Row TV where he personally disrespects me and numerous other legends in the American motorcycle club culture that you know, did some amazing things. And in this episode of Demons Row TV we're gonna watch, it appears that Sos the Ghost takes credit for unifying the American Motorcycle Clubs, getting them to communicate and stand up for the rights against law enforcement harassment. And he claims that this is just coming to fruition now. Um, that's a lie. He's had nothing to do with it. The reality is it started back in the 80s and what you're gonna find out from watching this episode of Demons Row TV is that Sos the Ghost is such an idiot and knows so little about American Motorcycle Club culture that he doesn't realize that the man in the BBC documentary we're gonna watch um, is a legend in, or was a legend in the American Motorcycle Club world and helped start the National Coalition of Motorcyclists. So without further ado, um, I wanna watch this. We're gonna watch it together and we're gonna watch him take credit for doing amazing things that he had nothing to do with together. And then I'm gonna break it down and explain the realities and I'll teach you the history of the motorcycle club culture. And in the process, I'll prove that Sos the Ghost is a poser, a punk, and a liar. And his show Demons Row TV is a fraud. But before we do that, if you're gonna claim you've done big things, in the motorcycle club culture, you better be able to back it up. And Sos the Ghost can't back it up, but I can. So I've told you I did big things, now let me show you. I spent over 22 years in the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture. I was mentored by legendary Hells Angels, Moldy Marvin Gilbert and Josh Bider. Later on, legends like Pig from the Outsiders, Boar from the Sons of Silence, and Roadblock from the Outlaws would become my dear brothers. I wrote manuals that taught the motorcycle club community nationally how to use public records requests to evidence motorcycle profiling and harassment by law enforcement, and how to use counter surveillance to chase away hostile law enforcement surveillance at our events and parties. I served as an officer in my motorcycle club as well as for the Washington Confederation of Clubs, and I helped organize and found the National Council of Clubs. 
I've served as a criminal defense investigator for every major 1% motorcycle club and testified as a defense expert witness during the trials. I helped pass the first two motorcycle profiling laws in the United States that prohibit law enforcement from profiling motorcycles. In 2011, I was the first outlaw biker to use social media to protect the culture by posting dash cam videos of law enforcement profiling motorcyclists. Just one of those videos I posted had over 3.8 million views. In 2012, my guerrilla documentary, What It's All About, which chronicles the unification of the motorcycle clubs of Washington State, the passing of the first law addressing motorcycle profiling by law enforcement, and the birth of the American Motorcycle Profiling Movement won the National Coalition of Motorcyclists Silver Spoke Award for Media Excellence. I was co-founder of the Motorcycle Profiling Project. In 2014, I was nominated for induction into the American Motorcycle Hall of Fame for two categories, leadership and motorcycle rights. What was really cool was I was fortunate enough to spend the last eight years of my time in the club culture traveling the country, speaking in over 32 different states to literally hundreds of thousands of motorcycle club members and motorcyclists. You know, I was being hosted by all the most respected 1% outlaw motorcycle clubs, getting treated like a VIP and developing close friendships and brotherhoods with the most respected leaders in the motorcycle club culture. I've experienced the 1% outlaw motorcycle club culture in the US, Canada, Europe, and I taught one of the only two motorcycle clubs in Cuba how to ride in a pack and prospect their members properly. I did everything you can as a one percenter except get all tweaked out, kicked out in bad standing, go to prison for the club, or die for the club. And those last two I was totally prepared to do. I'd given everything up for the club. I watched my former club and the motorcycle club culture change dramatically during my 22 years in life. And I didn't like what either had become. So in 2017, I quit the club in good standing with all my tattoos and went back to doing what was gonna make me happy. Playing with dogs, shooting guns, traveling, and protecting the world. My comments in this video are my own and are based on my personal experience having lived the club life as full on as you can for over 22 years. They're consistent with my beliefs and behavior throughout my time in the club world. So if people's feelings are hurt, I'm the one responsible for hurting them. And I stand behind my words and my opinion will never change. So toughen up.
All right, so now that you understand who I am and why I'm uniquely qualified to call this punk Sosa Dos out, um, I wanted to go ahead and, and take a look at this episode of Dina Gro TV with you. And to give you some foundation, the video we're about to, to watch is, um, in my opinion, it's historical in terms of motorcycle club culture because it was one of the first times that an outlaw, a 1% outlaw motorcycle club allowed um, a camera crew to come into their national run and videotape their national run. And the footage that came out of that, um, you know, uh, it, it was used how it was used. But there's some really historical footage in that documentary if you watch it start to finish. And what we're going to see here is video that was taken at the Sons of Silence Motorcycle Club's national run. And the member who's speaking um, it, it was a man, a member who was a Sons of Silence named Dago. And I believe he was in the club for over 35, 36 years at least. Um, and so what you need to understand is, is that just in and of itself, this footage is historical. But beyond that, at the time this footage was taken, um, there was some historical stuff going on in, in the motorcycle club culture that because of our code of silence, Dago can't tell the reporters about. He can, he can hint about it, but he can't because that's, that goes against the code. You know, and if you go against the code, you get kicked out of the club. So um, you'll notice that his interview is being monitored. If you watch the entire documentary, it's being monitored by other club officers. And, and that's the way it goes if you're going to talk to the media um, as a one percenter. Um, but, you know, beyond that, um, when we look at this footage together, um, what Dago is talking about, and you don't understand it yet, but you will when I get done, is he's talking about the, the idea behind what ended up becoming the National Coalition of Motorcyclists. And I'll get to that in a minute. But just understand what you're watching here is not only is this video footage historical from a civilian's point of view um, that's just interested in the motorcycle club culture, but from a one percenter's point of view or a former one percenter's point of view, um, it's historical from a standpoint of this is early outlaw motorcycle club history that led to something major. A and we got it on film. You know, the guys, it, the members at the time's enthusiasm is on film back then. So um, the last thing I would want to do is disrespect a legendary one percenter by censoring him in the video, especially if I was censoring him so that my video, my YouTube content wouldn't get demonetized, you know, and I could still make money from clicks and likes. And so um, as you watch this, I want you to understand that it's hugely offensive and disrespectful that Sos the Ghost chose to censor Dago and his historical statements. But also understand that Sos the Ghost has no clue what he's watching here. So, um, and he should, if he was a one percenter, if he was in any respected motorcycle club, he would know that, that what Dago is talking about is the idea behind the National Coalition of Motorcyclists, because it's a consistent language that we've used from 1985 to present. So, to describe why the clubs, you know, form the National Coalition of Motorcyclists. So, again, if you're going to click and like somebody's content, if you're going to watch it regularly, make sure that you know what you're watching because, and make sure that that person is producing accurate and relevant content because there's a lot of posers out there these days. And like I said, this guy's the biggest one. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a, a look at this episode of Dean and Grow TV and uh, then I'll break it down. So basically what this Sons of Silence member is talking about is the stuff that I talk about now, so let's run that clip real quick. Occasionally you have friction between another club. Other people that fly past you just like we do. When that comes down, uh, people have different ways of enforcing their beliefs. Be it us, be it them, it's, it's not the question so much as uh, you don't eat no sh you don't take no sh You wear your pads, it's your brother's right or wrong, it's your country right or wrong. It's my brother's right or wrong. Punk bitch, you censored if, if a fucking the legend. Started in a historical it or whatever the fuck, it wouldn't Fuck matter, it. Wouldn't it? You know, uh, they see me, they want to shoot me. Well, I'm gonna try to help to get the first one off. 
or they don't, you know. There's, there's the time has got to come where we're all going to have to sit down and talk at a table, and it ain't going to happen that way no more. The time is going to be forced upon us through persecution. The government's going to be our, their own undoing. In, in my book, this is it's my own conclusion on this. This is no absolute word or prophecy or anything. Uh, through my opinion, uh, the government's going to force us into association with one another because of persecution of us as groups. And the time will come where us and them are even going to have to sit down and talk to one another across the table. Because they couldn't exist as, as an organization if they were all, you know, like we should believe they, are, they must be. They couldn't exist. There must be somebody in there with a little bit of insight, a little bit of something upstairs to hear something. And if it's got to be a gunpoint, they're all going to sit down across the table and we're all going to talk. And then we're going to be what the government is so scared of. And that's one unit working together across this country, communication. That man we're long overdue. was a real leader. Since we'll be there. He's bringing up what I talk about all the time, and he's actually prophesizing what we're bringing to fruition now with the with the talks that we're talking. And, you know, there's people on the Internet that want to bring down shit the to fruition. That want to say bitch. that it's impossible. Nothing. Let you're a liar. You you're a phony. There's a lot of things in life you're making that money off a culture you know nothing about more than what you Whole see on the Internet and TV. Crumbled. You're you know what fraud. I mean? Like the Roman Empire crumbled. So anything is possible. And even back then, he understood that there's going to be a point where unification is a must. And just really yeah, man, think about back the day and time that we're in right now. We culture. are living in a day and time where all they have to do is just Fat say fuck. the numbers are up. In the media, and everything gets shut down. People lose their, their jobs. People lose their businesses, their homes. All right, churches I'm going to throw up. I can't watch this anymore. Let's just get into churches it. get closed. George Washington. All right, so I'm sorry I wasted your brain cells on that, but I think it's important that we watch it. And, and now you've seen it for yourself. When he says he's prophesizing what we're bringing to fruition today with the talks we're talking, um, you know, it's clear he's taking credit for unifying the American Motorcycle Club culture to stand up against law enforcement harassment. And the reality is that's an absolute lie. And not only is it a lie, but SOS would have never been in a position in the motorcycle club culture of leadership where anyone would have listened to him, and they certainly don't listen to him since he's not in a motorcycle club anymore. So that's out and out bullshit. But let me, let me prove that to you by teaching you some real motorcycle club history. And so um, I think the best place to start for that is at the very beginning. You know, and where the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture came from and talk about the protocols and traditions um, a little bit so that you can understand um, the type of club I came from and the type of clubs that created the National Coalition of Motorcyclists and made it succeed, started a successful, successful national grassroots rights movement and the type of clubs that SOS came from because they're really not a motorcycle club. Um, they're frauds. And, and, and so let's go back. And the thing that, that is important to understand is the outlaw, the American Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture, and I refer to it that way because it's different everywhere you go in the world. Just crossing the border into Canada, the motorcycle club culture is very different, even though you've got a lot of the same clubs. And so when you get to places like Europe or Australia or Southeast Asia, I mean, the culture gets dramatically different, um, you know, and, and even within the United States, just, uh, you know, club members in, in a specific club on the West Coast are going to be different and operate a little differently than the cl same club and its members and chapters on the East Coast. So there's sociological differences everywhere you go in, in the U.S. amongst the U.S. population, and you see that amongst the motorcycle clubs. It's normal. Um, so... Um, that's important to understand. When, when I talk about the American Motorcycle Club culture, I'm talking about our culture um, and, and how we do it. And I'm not saying it's the same universally because it's not. So that's important to understand. But it's generally accepted that the American Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture started 
in the World War II, post-World War II era with combat veterans returning home from war that were looking for, you know, a disciplined lifestyle based on loyalty, honor, respect, and brotherhood and adventure so that they could, they could fill the gap that was left by leaving that military lifestyle behind, behind uh, when they came home. And, and they also, it's important to understand that they also probably came home with undiagnosed PTSD because our country wasn't even thinking about that at the time. And these guys had just seen the most brutal fighting our, our country had seen, um, you know, in a long, long time. So, uh, you know, that played a role in it. And substance abuse played a role in it. And blowing off steam played a role in shaping this culture. And at the time that these guys were coming back and they were, you know, buying motorcycles, um, they bought primarily Harley Davidson and Indian motorcycles. And the reason they did that was because they were combat vets from World War II. And the Harley Davidson played an, an incredibly important role in combat in World War II. And so um, that is why every single American motorcycle club requires you, um, or American outlaw motorcycle club, requires you to ride an American-made motorcycle. And a lot require you to, to ride a Harley Davidson. So, um, you know, that's, that's an aspect of the culture that will probably never change and it should never change because it goes back to the roots of the culture and the roots of the culture in combat and fighting for your country and your rights. So it's important to understand that, that um, it's not just a weekend thing. The, the, an outlaw motorcycle club or any respected American motorcycle club it is not just a weekend thing. It's a lifestyle. It's a real culture. We have our own way of dress. We have our own traditions, our own protocols, um, you know, and, and our own customs and traditions. And, and um, so it, it's a very tribal culture. It's a very hierarchical culture. Um, and it's a very militaristic culture. It's all going back to its roots in combat. And so... Um, you know, when, when the clubs started, um, or the outlaw clubs started, um, back in that post-World War II era, the American Motorcycle Association was the only motorcycle association in the United States. And if you wanted to have a motorcycle club, or if you wanted to be involved in, in motorcycle racing, you had to join the American Motorcycle Association. And if you were gonna join the American Motorcycle Association, you had to follow their rules for behavior. You had to follow their rules for dress, their rules for how you put on races. And I mean, it was, it was a very um, regulated association. And with guys just returning from war that were wanting to cut loose and party, um, this immediately created conflict between those cl club members and the American Motorcycle Association that had a very straight-laced reputation. And ultimately, what ended up happening is so that they could have the fun that they wanted, um, these clubs that were not outlaw clubs yet, um, that term hadn't been, been you know, developed to identify them yet, um, but these clubs that, that were wild and having fun um, and like to party and raise a little hell, uh, they started having their own races where they could do whatever they want. AMA's behavior rules didn't, didn't apply. Um, it wasn't going to cost them their membership or their, their place in the races, you know, get them disqualified. And so they started having their own races. Well, this got very popular very quickly because it was a lot of fun to go to these races. And when it did, the AMA realized they weren't getting their cut of the money. And so they butted heads and told these guys, you either got to race with us or you're kicked out. And if you're going to race with us, you're going to behave properly. And so the what would become outlaw clubs, told the AMA, fuck you, we're gonna do what we want. And at the time, all the AMA clubs wore a one-piece patch identifying their club. And it had the club name, the club logo, and, and where they were from all in one piece on, on the back of the, the vest. And so these clubs that protested the AMA and told them to fuck off, you know, we're gonna build something bigger and better than what you've got. Um, they, as a symbol of unity and pride, they cut their patches into three pieces with the name of the club going on the top of the vest or the back of the vest, um, the logo for the club, 
in the center of the vest and where they were from on the bottom of the vest. And, and they did it to spread out the pack and make it look bigger and to distinguish themselves from AMA clubs. And again, as a, a fuck you to AMA, right? And uh, so anyway, when that happened, you had this whole culture that, that split off from mainstream American motorcycle club culture. And AMA is actually the one that identified them or, or gave the culture the label as outlaw motorcycle clubs. And it was because they were having these outlaw races that were not sanctioned by the AMA. It had nothing to do with crime or living a life of crime. It was because they were outlaws and refused to, to follow the AMA's rules and live under their thumb, and they chose to do, do their own thing. And so that's where the term outlaw motorcycle club came from. It has nothing to do with crime. That's all law enforcement bullshit. And for a long time, I'm, I'm talking like up until the mid-60s, these clubs, these outlaw clubs, all lived together for the most part fairly peacefully and got along and partied together. And, um, you know, I've, I've got, you'll see it in the, some of the historical pictures I've got. Um, you know, these clubs that were around back in the 50s and 60s, early 60s, um, all of a sudden ceased to exist in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and the reason that happened was because as we saw a new influx of vets come back from Vietnam, and a lot of the vets that were coming back had been special forces, and so they lived a very similar code to the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture's code. Um, they lived a very similar lifestyle as far as discipline and loyalty, honor, respect, and brotherhood. And so just like the World War II vets, when they came back, you know, they looked for the clubs and, and found the clubs as a source of adventure and brotherhood and, you know, everything they were missing from the military and combat experience. Um, the same thing happened with the Vietnam vets as they started coming back. But these guys had now seen a whole new level of horrific combat. And they had experienced drugs, hard drugs, overseas, and were coming home to hard drugs. And um, they were coming home with undiagnosed PTSD in a country that was not respecting them the way they deserved to be respected, right? And um, that, that all created this environment that led to more violence in the club world. And so while you had had, you know, numerous, numerous, numerous clubs all over the country identifying as outlaw motorcycle clubs, in beginning in the late 60s, when those Vietnam vets started coming back and they were, you know, a little more rigid uh, with how they were, and hardcore with how they were, uh, you know, their attitudes towards commitment to the club and, and how the club operated and whatnot. Um, the clubs that didn't operate consistent with the Outlaw Motorcycle Club code or the clubs that caused problems for the Outlaw Motorcycle Club community or for the, the motorcycle club community in general in the areas that they operated, those clubs got their patches pulled and got shut down. And so what I'm going to talk about now is um, a very important tradition. And it's something that no longer exists in really in the Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture but or in the American Motorcycle Club culture. But that's the tradition of patch pulling. And patch pulling, contrary to what law enforcement would have you believe, is not used as a tool to protect criminal territory or drug trafficking or anything like that. That's all nonsense. Patch pulling is a tradition that is used to protect the integrity and the sanctity and peace and harmony of the motorcycle club community. And so, um, you know, like I was saying, in the late 60s, you saw um, clubs start to get their patches pulled. And either it was because they were wearing 1% diamonds and identifying as an outlaw club, but they weren't following the protocols, the, the universally accepted protocols of the culture, or um, they were creating problems for the culture. And so when I say there's universally accepted protocols and, and norms for the culture, I think that's important that we understand that. And, and so going back, when the outlaw motorcycle clubs um, broke off from the AMA and started doing their own thing, um, you, they all adopted an unwritten code, um, a, a 
set of rules that we all universally live by. And um, it governs not only how you behave internally within your own club, um, but how you behave externally and how you interact with other club members and, and within the, the motorcycle club community. And so um, it, it was important that we all universally agreed to these protocols because that's what we agreed motorcycle clubs should be about. That's what we agreed outlaw motorcycle clubs should be, a, be about as well. And so whether you're in a Christian club, um, a, a veterans club, a community service oriented club, a women's club, um, or a 1% club, if you want to be part of mainstream outlaw motorcycle club culture, your club has to follow these protocols. And it's simple things like um, respect gets respect. That's the number one rule of the American motorcycle club culture. If you don't show respect, you're not going to get any respect. And um, so that's important to remember as we move forward and talk about these other clubs. Um, and talk about clubs like Sosa's old club. Um, but it, it's also things like, you know, we prospect members. Nobody gets a patch for free. Um, no pimp in your pack, meaning you can't use your membership in your motorcycle club um, to earn respect or profit for yourself, right? Um, that's just not allowed. Uh, we don't talk to cops. We don't testify against other bikers. You know, it, it's a code. And, and so... It doesn't matter what kind of motorcycle club you're in. It's the code that we all agree to live by. And um, it includes things like how you start motorcycle clubs. And so um, to maintain the peace and harmony in the community, patch pulling uh, came into play. And um, you know the clubs that didn't follow and adhere to the accepted protocol were shut down because you know, like with any culture, um, the, the rules, traditions, and norms and protocols of that culture um, shape its identity. And so if you say, you know, fuck you to the, the, the culture, we're not riding American motorcycles, and we'll go ahead and testify against other bikers, and we'll call the police on other bikers, um, you're not part of that culture, right? Um, you might ride motorcycles and, and wear a patch, but you're not part of the culture because... You don't live by any of the cultural protocols and norms, you know. And so as we move forward, remember that because it's important to understand. If you want to be in a motorcycle club, you can't dumb it down. Or if you want to start a motorcycle club, you can't dumb it down. You've got to adhere to the cultural protocols and norms. All right, so I've talked to you about patch pulling and how if you don't follow the protocol and the culture, you're going to get your patch pulled. Or back in the day, you'd get your patch pulled and shut down because you're giving the public a, a, um, a bad look at motorcycle clubs. They, they can't distinguish between us. They think everybody's a hell's angel. It doesn't matter what patch you're wearing. Everybody's a hell's angel to them. And so what one club does, we all get blamed for. And um, that doesn't matter whether it's a mom and pop club or it's a 1% club. What one club does, we all get blamed for in the public side. And, and um, that's why maintaining the integrity of the culture is important. Um, and that's why patch pulling was important, you know. But on the flip side of that, you had clubs that were just way out there. And they lived to, to a whole different set of rules and, and were not motorcycle clubs. They were, I, I don't want to call them organized crime groups either because they were very disorganized. They were motorcycle clubs that existed to commit crimes. So they were gangs, right? Um, and the 1%, the major 1% clubs, um, when those clubs would start problems, would shut those clubs down. Because, again, their criminal activity, their violence, it all fell back on the American Motorcycle Club community as a whole. Not just the clubs in that area, but all of us got blamed for it across the country. And um, so pulling patches of clubs that were creating problems for the entire community um, w became necessary. And one club in particular, I'll, I'll give as an example, um, there was a club up here in the Northwest that at one point in time, um, every major outlaw motorcycle club in the Northwest shut them down, and then at one point we shut them down together. And these guys were off the chain. 
they wore patches and identified as a 1% outlaw motorcycle club, and they rode motorcycles, but they would cooperate and testify with the cops. Um, they would shoot other bikers in the back regularly. Um, they would, uh, uh, well, one of their members killed one of his brothers and his brother's old lady, and then to dispose of the bodies, he put them in a commercial meat grinder here in Washington State and fucking ground them up. And so who knows where they went. But, like, those are the types of, of acts that when they happen over and over and over again, um, it creates problems for the community. And that led to that club being shut down permanently, you know. And, um, you know, every now and then a member will get released. One of their old members will get released from prison. You know, last time this happened, within a year and a half, the guy was trying to blow up clubhouses of other clubs because, you know, he wanted to bring back beefs from the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, so patch pulling became an important part of regulating in, in the integrity of the culture. Now, in the late 90s, um, the feds started using patch pulling um, to be able to indict RICO offense, related offenses. And so those patch pullings, um, which were part of the culture, um, and in the past had been no big deal. Uh, now the feds were prosecuting them, and they were prosecuting them as things like armed robbery and aid of racketeering, where guys were looking at doing 25 years to life, you know, for pulling a patch, uh, for, for, you know, exercising one of the traditions of the culture. And so in the late 90s, uh, continuing until about like 2003, 2004, 2005, somewhere in there, um, the 1% clubs started to stop pulling patches because all of them communicate and they all realized based on what was happening with one particular club that the feds were using patches to indict major RICO cases. Um, and so they all stopped pulling patches. It didn't mean you still wouldn't get your ass kicked because um, you would, but you'd be left with your patch. And eventually even that stopped because of the feds use of RICO. Um, and so, you know, by the, the like I said, by, by 2005, um, that was really when patch pulling stopped um, nationwide, and we had to stop. Uh, and um, when that stopped, what happened as a result is you saw clubs start to pop up like the Iron Order and so the old, Ghosts Old Club, uh, the Thug Riders. You know, both those clubs were founded by active duty law enforcement, corrections officers, ATF agents in the Iron Order's case. Like, you know, they're not outlaw motorcycle clubs. And they operate on a totally different set of protocol that's so watered down um, and contradictory to tradition American motorcycle club protocol, whether it's outlaw protocol or just our mainstream American motorcycle club protocol. There's just so watered down and foreign. Um, it's you, you can't call them motorcycle clubs. Now they'll tell you they're a motorcycle club, and they'll tell you they're one percenters. Um, it's all bullshit. You can't be, you know, an American motorcycle club if you don't follow the the cultural traditions, norms, and protocol, right? And um, the only similarities is, is that they wear patches, and they ride all sorts of motorcycles. Um, other than that, th there's no similarity between clubs like the Iron Order and the Thug Riders and, you know, even uh, a mainstream American women's motorcycle club. I've got more of respect for women's motorcycle clubs because they follow the protocol than I do for the Thug Riders and the Iron Order. I mean, they're a bunch of douchebag lanes. So, um, you know... And the, the reason behind that is, be, is because they don't follow the protocol. And where they first got off to, you know, not following the protocol w was with how they started their clubs. And so there's this huge misconception that in order to start a motorcycle club, you have to get the permission of the dominant clubs and pay a tax to the COC or Confederation of Clubs. And that's all bullshit, right? Um, the way you start a motorcycle club is you go to the major motorcycle clubs in your area, and there might be a dominant 
or there might not be, like if you're from Washington State, where we've got every major outlaw club represented in the state um, for the most part, you know, uh, um, and a lot of the history goes back to the 60s. And so you're going to need to go to the clubs. And in my opinion, and since I've started a non-1% club before, um, I can speak to this, uh, you don't ever ask permission. You go to the big clubs, the respected clubs, and you show them the respect they deserve, and you announce your intentions and tell them you don't want to step on anybody's toes, but you're going to start a club, and you're going to be involved in the community. And they might be a little bit shocked. They might try and intimidate you and tell you you need to be a support club, but stand firm. Tell them, no, this is what we want to do, and here's why we want to do it. And they may tell you that, hey, there's plenty of good clubs out there. Uh, why don't you go join one of those? And I would agree with them. You should probably go join one of the established clubs rather than try and do your own thing. Because the clubs that have been around a long time doing it, whether they're a 1% club, a mom and pop club, or a veterans club, or even you know some of these women's clubs that have been around for 20, 30 years now, um, they know what they're doing because they've lasted that long. And so um, go to an established club. Don't start your own thing. But back on track, right? When the Iron Order and Sos to Go Soul Club started, because they started with active duty law enforcement as their founders, they knew they couldn't go to any respected motorcycle club, whether it's a woman's club, a Christian club, whatever, and you know, announce their intentions and get any respect because they were loaded with active duty cops, and that's just totally contradictory to the culture. Now, there's been exceptions here and there, but not like not like these clubs, right? And uh, the exceptions were very rare exceptions where those guys were known to the community first, you know, um, before they ever took their jobs, right? So um, anyway, when Sos the Ghosts and, and Old Club, the Thug Riders and the Iron Order started, they didn't go to the 1% Club and, and show the respect that every other club had shown and say, hey, we're here, we're going to do this. You know, we want to be part of the community. They just ostracized themselves and came up with these bullshit lies about mainstream motorcycle club culture that they could use as excuses for not getting involved. You know, things like, well, it's a free country and the Constitution says we can start a club if we want to, so we're going to start a club. Well, yeah, that's true. The Constitution does say that. But, but you can't just start a fucking pro football team and say, this is what I'm going to do, right? You gotta go to the NFL. You gotta petition that shit. You gotta get sanctioned. And then you can start a team. It's the same thing with the motorcycle club culture. Whether you're a mom and pop club or you're an outlaw club, if you wanna start a motorcycle club, you gotta show the culture respect and you gotta get involved. And to do that, you gotta go to, to the old respected clubs in that area and say, hey, here's what we're doing. We wanna be involved. You know, and you gotta stand up for your club and your idea. Or you got to join an existing club, one of the two, you know. But they didn't do that. They came up with excuses. We can't get involved in the Confederation of Clubs because there's felons. And, and you know, we've got law enforcement in our membership, so we can't be involved with felons. Well, there's fucking felons in law enforcement, too. <laughs> they just haven't been caught yet, you know. So, <clears throat> anyway, that's why when we talk about... Um, when I say Sos the Ghost is a poser, he, he's a poser. He comes from a poser club. They don't live like we live. They don't live um, by our cultural protocols and norms. And really, they're such a bizarro world for us and so foreign to us. Um, and, and we have such little respect for them. They're ostracized from the community. And so they've formed their own little bizarro world and their bizarro motorcycle club culture. There's nothing legitimate about it. There's nothing respected about it. And they really don't know what they're talking about when it comes to outlaw motorcycle clubs or mainstream American motorcycle club culture because they don't live it and they don't live within it, right? If you see them at a motorcycle event where there's other clubs, it's a big public event because they aren't invited to our clubhouses because we don't respect them, right? So as we move forward, understand that you know, beginning in about 2003 2000, uh, to 2005, when the clubs quit pulling patches, you saw this bizarre world motorcycle club culture, the Sos to Go Sold Club, the Iron Order, and a bunch of other fucking lame clubs like them. 
Um, they've got their own COC their, or rip off versions of the COC. And, you know, now they're all starting to wear 1% diamonds, but they're not 1%ers. They don't live by the 1% code and they don't even really understand our culture. All right. So next I want to talk about the National Coalition of Motorcyclists because um, really, you know, that's what this episode of Demons Row TV is all about. Uh, and that's what the clip from BBC is all about. But because Dago is a righteous one percenter and he's got a bunch of club members standing around and making sure that he lives by the outlaw biker code, we don't talk to civilians. Um, you know, he he can't explain to whoever's interviewing him that, hey, we're getting ready to start this thing made up of all the motorcycle clubs from across the country called the National Coalition of Motorcyclists. And, you know, um, it's going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. The clubs are all unified. We're going to fight law enforcement harassment and protect our culture. He can't say that. He can't be excited about that. Um, so, you know, he's doing his best to, to explain what's going on in the culture um, without giving up the secrets, right? Without violating the code, because if he violates the code, he gets kicked out of his club in bad standing, right? So can't violate the code. Um, you know, so, uh, Let's talk about the National Coalition of Motorcyclists for, for a minute. And where that came from um, is it, it started as a result of what we were seeing happen in the motorcycle club culture across the country in the mid to late 70s. And it all came from the formation of uh, ATF and the International Outlaw Motorcycle Gang Investigators Conference, which later became known and is now known as the International Outlaw Motorcycle Gang Investigators Association. So what the IOMGIA, or the National Outlaw Motorcycle Gang Investigators Association, what they are is they're an association made up of federal, state, and local law enforcement agents, uh, prosecutors, correction officers, um, that specialize in investigating outlaw motorcycle clubs. And the IOMGIA serves as a centralized point for um, intelligence dissemination on outlaw motorcycle clubs and training um, for these law enforcement. And so um, when the IOMGIA started, or the IOMGIC, I guess, when they were originally started, um, when that started, what we saw seeing, or we started seeing in the club world across the country was consistent tactics. And those tactics were plant drugs on club members and frame them for charges they didn't commit, beat them, and if you can, shoot them and kill them. And, you know, that was really concerning. And so there was a raid in Florida on the Outlaws Clubhouse um, in the late 70s where um, that's exactly what we saw in that raid. And they ended up shooting a member. He was he didn't die, um, but he was so heavily brain damaged that um, they couldn't charge him with anything because he couldn't assist in his own defense. Now, somehow, years later, with still having the same brain damage, the feds were able to get him declared competent, and he was the first biker ever convicted of RICO. Um, so, you know, like we saw him start playing dirty pool with us, and they were violating our constitutional rights. They were you know, framing us, and they were trying to kill us. And what we saw happen at the Outlaws Clubhouse in Florida was mirrored in the tactics of the Portland Police Bureau Narcotics Task Force when they served a warrant on December 12, 1979, on the Outsiders Clubhouse in Portland, Oregon. But fortunately, in the out Outsiders case, um, they were able to prove that the cops came with dope, you know, taped to their legs that they planned on planning at the clubhouse and you know that they didn't knock and announce and were dressed in plain clothes um, and they what made it worse is that they had lied about the informant that they used uh, to get the warrant with and so there was no informant and the warrant was totally illegal so um, it was an illegal attack on the outsiders clubhouse but because there's no at the time there was no cnn there was no national news or internet um, you know, it was quietly swept under the rug despite it leading to like 82 or 86 major 
uh, criminal cases being overturned and the biggest police corruption scandal in Portland history. So, like, um, we saw consistent tactics as a community. And we knew that um, we needed to fight back against law enforcement uh, or, you know, we weren't going to have a motorcycle club culture anymore. It, it was going to get wiped out by, you know, their corrupt activities. And so, you know, that was kind of, clubs were talking about this. And right around the same time, a personal injury attorney in California named Richard Lester, uh, who had a national network of personal injury attorneys, um, a lot of whom represented motorcycle club members, and were talking about, hey, we're hearing this about, you know, these bikers being framed or these illegal warrants. And um, Lester started talking to some of his clients, motorcycle clubs, about this idea that, you know, we had more in common than we had differences, and we needed to sit down at the same table and start communicating. We could avoid a lot of the conflicts that we're having in the community. And, you know, we, can, we could start developing um, a plan to stand up for our civil rights and fight back against this law enforcement harassment, discrimination, and corruption that was going to wipe out the culture. And his idea, Lester's idea, was that we start this national coalition of all the clubs. And once a year, we get together and communicate with each other and update each other on what's going on um, in our, our individual areas around the country. And, uh, um, you know, he'd provide attorneys that could educate us on, you know, things we could do to stand up for our civil rights. And so in um, 1985 in Las Vegas, Richard Lester, um, with the help of J.R. Reed, who was the national president of the Sons of Silence at the time, very respected member of the Sons and, and just a legend in the outlaw motorcycle club culture. Um, without J.R., NCOM probably would have never happened because J.R. had critical relationships with every major outlaw motorcycle club. And he was able to go to them and say, hey, and speak to their leadership and say, hey, man, Here's what this attorney came up with, and I think we should listen to him because it sounds like it might work and it might protect us and, and you know, would be good for the culture. And so in 1985, all the major motorcycle clubs in the United States got together for the very first time. And Richard Lester was there. And over the course of a couple of days, um, they outlined what would become the National Coalition of Motorcyclists, which is not a sanctioning body by any means. Um, it's a motorcycle rights organization and a communication organization. They do not tax clubs to exist. That's all a bunch of law enforcement bullshit. If you, you, you pay a membership uh, to belong to your local COC, and that gets you into the National. Um, you know, so, um, but they're, they're communication and motorcycle rights organizations. And, the Confederation of Clubs, or what, what I've been referring to as the COC, um, is the state level organization. And so what came out of that Vegas meeting was Lester agreed to um, allow the clubs to, to use one of their personal injury attorneys whenever we would meet, um, which for most state Confederation of Clubs is, is once every other month. Um, he could be present. And they would help give us advice on, on legal issues we were having and, and uh, civil rights issues we were having. And they'd give us legal help when we needed it. And so, you know, the idea that Sos the Ghost had anything to do with unifying the clubs is nonsense because the guy can't be that old. And I don't know how old he was in 1986 or if he was even born. But I can guarantee you he was not in that meeting in Vegas in 1986. So... He had nothing to do with unifying the clubs because it started at that meeting in 1986. And every year since then, there's been a major confederation of, excuse me, National Coalition of Motorcyclists convention every single year where all the clubs from across the country get together. And it's, you know, several days of seminars on, you know, everything from motorcycle profiling and law enforcement harassment and discrimination to how to render first aid to your buddy if he goes down on his motorcycle, to, um, you know, uh, you name it. There's all sorts of, uh, of seminars. Um, 
that are put on over these several days. And then, you know, Saturday night, there's a big banquet and a social. And it's, for me, it was my favorite event because, you know, for five days, I'd be holed up in a hotel uh, with literally tens of thousands of motorcycle club members from every major motorcycle club across the country. Didn't matter if they were women's, Christian, veterans, 1%, we were all there and, and we came in numbers, you know, and um, it was the most impressive uh, thing. I, I mean, I remember going to my first NCOM convention. It was the most impressive thing I've ever seen because you've been led to believe your entire life that motorcycle clubs don't get along and then now you get a peek behind the curtain and yeah, we do communicate. We're very organized, you know, on a national level. And so um, what grew out an NCOM is a level of cooperation and communication amongst the clubs. And as things started to get worse for the culture, uh, um, the state COCs started pushing for various legislation to protect the culture. Things ranging from you know, trying to do away with helmet laws or prevent helmet laws from being enacted to uh, motorcycle profiling legislation that would prevent law enforcement from harassing motorcyclists. And so beginning in about 2005, Washington State started uh, pushing to, to pass a motorcycle profiling bill that was uh, modeled after the state's uh, racial profiling bill. And I became part of that movement in, well, I was involved um, at that point in time, but I wasn't, I wasn't a leader. I, I, I you know, wasn't a player. Uh, I was just at the meetings. Um, but by 2007, I was a player. And um, what ended up happening is in about 2008, um, 2009, we ended up having a, a motorcycle club member um, who was riding home from our clubhouse one night. Uh, he wasn't in our club. He, he got pulled over with a couple other members from his club as they were headed back south by Washington State Patrol. And the trooper ordered him to take off his helmet or he'd arrest him for, and I'll quote, uh, uh, yeah, for something. Shut it down. Shut it down so I can hear you. Put the kickstand up. Kickstand up. Leave it up. Take your helmet off. You'll take your helmet off. You will take your helmet off. I'll arrest you for, for uh, yeah, for something. Take it off. Take it off or you'll go to jail. Put your hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. The cop arrested him and uh, took him for obstruction, and I can't remember what the other charge was. Regardless, um, the COC sued the Washington State Patrol for that arrest, and we ended up getting a $93,000 judgment against the Washington State Patrol. And both the video and that judgment served as crucial pieces of evidence um, to help Washington State and the Washington Confederation of Clubs um, pass the very first law in the United States that prohibits law enforcement from profiling bikers. Um, and that was huge. You know, we had unified every outlaw motorcycle club in the state and every motorcycle club in the state to the point that we started a successful grassroots rights movement. And we passed a law that everyone told us we'd never be able to pass that protected bikers from being harassed by cops, right? It was a major, major thing for us and for our community and for the motorcycle club community nationally. So for years, we flew around the country um, teaching clubs and confederation of clubs, um, you know, how to, uh, start their own motorcycle profiling legislative movement. And we started the National Grassroots Rights Movement, which became known as the American Motorcycle Profiling Movement. And it's now successfully passed motorcycle profiling laws in several states. So when somebody like Sosa the Ghost, who was not in a real motorcycle club and fraudulently claims to be a one percenter, claims that he's bringing to fruition now um, stuff that was being talked about and started back in the mid-80s and that, that 
I was one of the men that helped accomplish those things. He personally disrespects and dishonors me, and he dishonors and disrespects every major respected motorcycle club in the United States that has ever played a role and participated in the National Coalition of Motorcyclists or the various states confederation of clubs or the American Motorcycle Profiling Movement. The dude's a douchebag. He's a punk bitch that owes the entire American motorcycle club culture an apology. All right, so the primary way that guys like Sos the Ghost exploit the culture is via the culture's code of silence. We don't talk to outsiders. So, um, and you can't pimp your patch. So he has no fear that a real one percenter is going to come on and rebut any of his videos. He knows that the, the culture prohibits it. So he's able to get away with his lies. It's like the ultimate stolen valor scam, you know, but there are guys like me who we're not in the club. Nobody's holding our tongue anymore. And so we can say whatever the fuck we want and our resumes eclipse his. And so that's why I'm speaking out. You know, I learned the history on outlaw motorcycle club culture from the legends. You know, the, I was in a transitional generation that, you know, I'd been doing it since the nineties. Um, I learned from guys who were charter members and legitimate legends in the culture. And it wasn't just from hanging around one club. Over the years, I developed close brotherhoods um, with legends from every major 1% club. And so I got to learn the history and hear the history and the stories firsthand from those men. And from the time I got into the motorcycle club culture in the 90s um, with guys like Marvin mentoring me and Josh, they taught me your job is to learn the history because it's an oral history. And so it's passed down orally. And if we don't learn the history and make an effort to pass that down to the next generation behind us, the history will be forgotten, the traditions and the customs will be forgotten, and the identity of the culture will dissolve and, and will lose the culture. And so I was taught from the time I started hanging around um, the, the part of my, my number one jobs was to learn the history of the club and, and the community and the conflicts and the, the, even the, the criminal investigations, you know, because you needed to understand how they were targeting us and what kind of sneaky shit they were pulling. And so, you know, that was my job. And then, you know, as a prospect, you'd get tested on the history. And if you didn't know the history, you were going to prospect until you learned the history and could answer all the questions right you know, um, or you're going to get run down the road because that's the way it was back then. And so, um, you know, understanding the history and understanding the Outlaw Motorcycle Club has an oral history, which requires the members of the culture to pass it down generation to generation and to pass it down accurately um, is critical to understanding why what Sos the Ghost is doing with his spread of lies and self-glorifying nonsense is so dishonorable and disrespectful and, and the negative impact it has on a whole. You know, I don't know how many viewers he has, but um, however many he has is too many because those people all believe his nonsense, you know? And that's not outlaw motorcycle club culture. That's not American motorcycle club culture. Like I said, it's his bizarro fucking cop club version of motorcycle club culture. They're not one percenters, you know? Um, they're not even respected American motorcycle clubs, you know, and so um, it, it's not giving the public an accurate look. All right, so next I want to talk about what Sos the Ghost refers to as culture vultures. And a culture vulture is somebody who exploits the outlaw motorcycle club culture for profit and personal gain. Basically, Sos the Ghost, right? And, um, you know, there's there's, like I said, there's some unwritten rules in outlaw motorcycle club culture. And one of those unwritten rules that's consistent through every motorcycle club in mainstream American motorcycle club culture, regardless of whether you're a 1% club or a Christian club, is the rule of no pimping your patch. And we talked about a little bit earlier um, that pimping your patch is, you know, earning respect 
or profit for yourself off your membership in the club. And that's just not tolerated. It's disrespecting your club and your brothers. Um, so, um, you know, when we talk about pimping your patch, one of the things that that rule prohibits you from doing is social media. And so while I was the first outlaw biker to use social media to protect and defend the culture, um, and I did it by posting dash cam videos of cops violating bikers' civil rights, to do that, I couldn't just throw those up. I had to go to my club and get permission to put those up, and I had to go to the, the Confederation of Clubs because I was representing my community to put those videos up. Because I, I, while I wasn't making any personal comments on it, it was videos of motorcycle club members, right? It was about our culture. And that's how tightly we, we controlled every aspect of our culture back then, right? And th this is not a long time ago. This is like 2008, 2009. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I had a YouTube channel back then, but everything that was put up was tightly controlled. There was no personal commentary. It was just strict facts. This is the law. You know, this is how you, this cop is violating our rights. Um, and, and then it was the video. Um, so, you know, had I wanted to do what Sos the Ghost did, or does, and have a little channel that talks about the culture and protocol and makes it seem like I've got inside knowledge, or worse, shared some of that inside knowledge, it would have got me kicked out of my club in bad standing. So we know Sos the Ghost was never in a real motorcycle club because he started his YouTube channel when he was in that club. Furthermore, we know he was never a real one percenter because he chose to give up his club to be able to do his YouTube channel. No real motorcycle club member, whether you're in a one percent club or a mom and pops or a women's club, is going to choose profit in a YouTube channel over loyalty, honor, respect, and brotherhood. You know, so right there it shows that, that he doesn't live by our protocol. He doesn't live by our cultural norms. And so he isn't one of us. He's a fraud. But beyond that, we can look at, at, at what we know. I mean, this punk is, a, is he's what we call a painted pony, right? And he, he, what I mean by that is he's somebody whose tattoos don't mean anything. I got my tattoos during the, my time in the club world. They record my history in the club world. They tell you what my role was, right? And... and they give you an idea of my level of commitment to the club. Now, in this day and age, a lot of guys aren't earning their tattoos like I did. Uh, they're just slapping shit on to look cool, and they're putting it on places like their face. And like, what the fuck are you thinking? But all right. Um, anyway, we look at Sos the Ghost. All we got to do is go back on his YouTube content about a year ago, and this dude was still representing his criminal street gang. His little boss player's tattoo. He had no biker tattoos. Oh, yeah. You know, because he wasn't committed to his club. And he got his biker tattoos, which don't appear to be club tattoos. They're motorcycle-related tattoos. But I don't rep recognize anything that, that is specific to his motorcycle club. But he started getting biker tattoos after he left his motorcycle club. You don't do that. You get your tattoos as you earn them during your time in the club. A and, you know... Every motorcycle club, whether it's a 1% club or, you know, a mom and pop club, when you leave that club, you don't keep getting club tattoos, you know? But when we look at his content, when we go back and we look at his content, what we can see is not only did he get these motorcycle tattoos, you know, um, and he was repping um, his street gang tattoo his entire time in the club, but even his, his motorcycle tattoos are poser bitch tattoos, right? So, like, let's take a look at this, this newest tattoo he's got on his throat here. What is a fucking one diamond, man? One diamond, what the fuck does that mean, right? Real 1% diamond tattoos? There's a really important thing that you have there. It's a symbol, one, 1%, right? You got a one diamond. What does that even mean, man? Like, just one calorie, not enough? You're the Diet Coke of fucking outlaw bikers? No, 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 no. I know. With those girl jeans, it means you're daddy's number one bitch. That's what that means. You're proud to be daddy's number one bitch with your girl jeans. Like, what the fuck, you poser? So, 
Right. You know, we'll talk about culture vultures because we got to talk about culture vultures because Sos the Ghost is the ultimate culture vulture. He steals our symbols. Goes just far enough that, you know, it, in a quick glance, you'll think that's a 1% diamond. But if he's in a bar with a real 1%er and somebody like me comes up to him and says, hey, man, what the fuck does that tattoo mean? What club are you in? You know, why don't you have a percent symbol? He's going to say, oh, it's not about a motorcycle club. It means I'm daddy's number one bitch. And, you know, see, there's no percent symbol. So don't kick my ass. Right? Like, that's why that t tattoos the way it is. You know? And, and so, like, like I said, this guy dishonors and disrespects our culture because he doesn't follow the protocols or norms. He was never in a real motorcycle club. He was certainly never a real one percenter. You know? And he steals our symbols and uses them for his own personal gain. And most specifically, right? Like, let's take a look at this little thumbnail here from one of his videos. Because, you know, these symbols that he, he's put up here, we've got, you know, two 1% diamonds, and then, you know, that diamond with the, the skull and crossbones in the middle. Um, those, are, those are significant symbols, and they've got significant meaning. But Sos doesn't know the meaning behind those symbols because he's never earned them, right? And he's just stealing them and talking about them to make people think that he knows what he's talking about and that he earned them. So specifically, I want to talk about that, that diamond in the middle there, that, that skull and crossbones in the diamond, or what's more accurately referred to as the Totenkopf inside the diamond. Now, that patch has its own specific name, and it's got its own specific meaning. And I know the history behind that patch incredibly well. And here's how I know the history on that patch so well. It's because, Sosi Poo, you jacked a patch that I created. That graphic that you've got up there advertising your video, that, that skull and crossbones in that diamond is a patch I designed and I wore and a couple of my brothers wore. And, you know, <laughs> you could never earn it. So I don't know what you're doing showing it up, up there. Um, but, you know, you're stealing my culture, my culture, something I created. And I know that there was nobody else out there wearing that diamond because I've been on the national scene long enough by the time I put that diamond on that I knew nobody else was out there wearing it. That was my creation, right? You know, and my creation dates back well over a decade, you know? And if you don't believe it, here's one of the very first patches that I, that I designed. This was the very first design. Now it changed a little bit over the years as far as color of the border. Um, but if you go back and watch the video of my pictures, you'll see me wearing that patch, you know, in it's different incarnations throughout that going back over a decade, man. So when you talk about culture vultures, you're the ultimate fucking culture vulture. I just want to say thanks for taking the time to watch this, and I hope you've learned something about Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture. I hope that I was a little bit entertaining, and um, you know, I hope I've given you the knowledge and skills you need to be able to see through and identify the self-glorifying nonsense that's being produced by guys like Sos the Ghost, and identify accurate and relevant sources of Outlaw Motorcycle Club related content. You know, um, history is important. And if we don't tell the history, the culture will die because you can't maintain cultural integrity without passing down the history.